Morning, everybody. Thanks for joining another awesome session of Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. Uh, my name is Joe Gorowski, and for those who don't know, we're all about connecting classrooms uh, to science, adventure, and conservation. And I'm very excited for our guest today, uh, Stephanie Arney. I'm going to give her a little intro now. So she's the first female host of the iconic show, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. She's worked in leading zoos across the U.S., as well as educational organizations in Japan, Thailand, Malaysia, New Zealand, and Papua New Guinea. So as well as hosting Wild Kingdom, she's also a public speaker and an authority on global efforts in conservation and sustainability. So let me turn on the mics and the classrooms can say hi. 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 Uh, Stephanie, here you go. Here you go. Hi. All right, Stephanie, great to have you joining us today. And um, I'll let you take over because I know you've got some good stuff to share today. Uh, first of all, we'll have to thank you for doing uh, organizing something this cool. This is really cool. I love this. I love that I could be sitting comfortably in my house right now and not have to get on a plane to go to New Jersey and California and all in Canada uh, right now. It's kind of nice to be home and be able to teach you guys. And so welcome to my home. I'm in San Diego, California right now, and uh, it's pretty sunny and nice. Is it? Is the weather looking good over there, guys? Oh, we just got on. Sorry. Do we have a thumbs down? Is it cold where all you are? You know, it's uh, probably warmer in California, but up here we're sitting at about four, five degrees today. So in Canada, it's getting colder. Do we have somebody else joining us? Fourth grade, Oak Hills Terrace, San Antonio, Texas. I don't know if you can hear us or not. Yeah, I can. This would be distressful. There you are. Okay. Yeah, go ahead, Stephanie. They're ready. All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to my home. Uh, my name is Stephanie, like you said, and I host an animal show that you can find all online. It's pretty exciting. And today I'm here to share with you a little bit about my life and all the different types of careers that I've had. And then I want to end it by showing you one of the episodes that we filmed with manatees down in Florida. Does that sound good to everybody? Can I get a thumbs up if that sounds good? <laughs> That's so cool. This is so cool. Okay. So I am going to hopefully share my screen the way that I'm supposed to. Okay. Tim, yeah. I'm going to need some assistance. Hold on one moment, please. That's okay. I want to show that. Not backwards for everybody, is it? There. Okay. All right, can everybody see this? Oh. So, Stephanie, just when you select the share screen, can you choose the option to do the whole desktop? Otherwise, when you choose play, it comes back to you. Okay, hold on. I thought we did that, but maybe not. Desktop, share screen. Okay. Now, are you seeing, seeing my whole screen? Yep, yeah, there we go. Awesome. So, Joe, will you let me know verbally that everybody can see it and hear me? Thumbs up, you can see the screen. Yep, there we go. And you cannot see me, correct? Yep, that's correct, Stephanie. Would you prefer that you can see me while I'm showing this screen? No, this is perfect. All right. Okay, everybody, I'm going to tell you the story of um, pretty much a quick story of my life and how I got to where I am today. Um, the picture of me right there is me holding... Um, uh, South American or South African penguin. Yes, there are such things as warm weather penguins. 
it's pretty cool. Um, okay, so I don't know about you guys, but my dream started when I was about five years old. I wanted to work with animals at a really young age, and I think not just because I wanted to play with exotic animals. That's not really what the drive was. It was mostly that I wanted to speak for animals that couldn't speak for themselves, and <clears throat> I wanted to teach people about the importance of every single species, whether they're small and what you maybe would consider ugly like a tarantula or cute and exciting like a dolphin. To me, all animals have a purpose and are beautiful, and so I think that's what drove me to want to be somebody that taught people about animals. Um, so I grew up in Iowa. I don't know if anybody's ever been there before. Those are some pretty cool pictures of me. Um, that's mm -hmm. me with some sunglasses looking rad. And um, I think in the upper corner, I'm about to spit out my milk because I thought that was funny when I was a kid. And <laughs> I traveled all over from um, as a kid because my parents moved a lot. And I don't know about any of you, but moving a lot when you're a kid is pretty hard, isn't it? You know, when you're traveling, you have to go to a whole new city with a whole new school and meet all new friends. And all those arrows showed you how many places I moved before I was 10 years old. So... Instead of being sad and mad about it, I actually turned it around and got exciting and saw it more as, um, you know, a challenge, as something exciting, and that it would make me smarter and stronger and wiser. And then I became um, a, kind of addicted to wanting to see more of the U.S. and, of course, the world as I got older. And just so you could kind of get to know me a little bit more, I was a gymnast, I was a cheerleader. Uh, I like to write for the yearbook. Um, I, I used to like to get involved in all the activities that were happening in the community, and I volunteered at the Humane Society. And uh, I just really like to be active and involved because it kept me feeling like I was a part of a bigger family. And I remember when I was a kid telling my friends and teachers that I wanted to work with animals. And I even had a career counselor once tell me, Oh, Stephanie, you're not smart enough to work with animals. And I don't know. I don't know about you, but I think that's pretty mean, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it, what's really important is that you surround yourself around friends that love you and are nice to you and and help support your dreams. And the older I got, the more I realized how important that was. And you know what? I proved them wrong anyway. I started working with my aunt Lisa's horses, like you can see in the picture there on the left. I think I'm 13 there. And I started visiting a lot of zoos and aquariums so I could learn more about exotic animals. And then I went to college and I focused getting my degree on psychology and education. And I studied some animal stuff also. And then when I was a senior in college, when I was 23, I got the chance to go to Africa. And that was pretty amazing. I didn't think I would ever be able to leave the country. First of all, my, my family didn't make a whole lot of money. And uh, I didn't think that that would be an opportunity for me. But I was really lucky, and I got a scholarship to go. And all I had to do was write a paper and tell somebody how much I really wanted to travel the world, and they helped fund my trip to go over to Africa. And <clears throat> I met some pretty cool people and some amazing kids. If you look on the left there, that's a picture of me and some gentlemen that were gymnasts that were playing around on the beach one day for tips. And... I went over to them, I'm like, well, I can do that too. And they're like, no, girls can't do gymnastics. And I was like, well, yeah, right, watch this. And so I started doing handstands with them, and they thought it was the craziest thing they've ever seen. Because in their culture, it wasn't encouraged for girls to do anything. They didn't want girls to do gymnastics or dance. That was kind of all for the men. So I proved them wrong, and they got really excited and started giving my their tips to me. But obviously I said, no, I don't want your money. <laughs> uh, on the right are some school kids that are about your age, for some of you. They are very lucky if they get the chance to go to school. Uh, they have to have enough money to afford a pencil and a pen and a school uniform, because everybody wears school uniforms in most countries in Africa. And they are so grateful to be able to go to school at all. And I thought that was interesting because a lot of the kids I went to growing up hated school and, and didn't want to be there. And these kids were thankful and praying every day. They were like, please let me keep going to school. Because they know that if you go to school, you get an education. And then if you have an education, you can help change the world somehow. <clears throat> I actually got the opportunity to go out and see a real village with people that 
uh, still practiced a lot of their cultures, still did a lot of singing and dancing. They uh, still ate and lived off of the land, which I thought was really neat. And some of them had never even seen white people before, so they were really mesmerized by us also. And you know what? They are some of the friendliest, happiest, most appreciative people I'd ever met in my life. Everybody pictures that children and people from other countries are so sad, but really they are very happy and they're excited with what they have. They might not have iPhones and stuff, but they love life. And they were so giving. They tried to give me food, like this boy with the lime, and a lot of the time I traded them for pens and pencils because that means that they could go to school. And I spent a lot of time having conversations with them about uh, their culture and about what they ate and about how they coexisted with animals. Can you imagine playing hide-and-go-seek and having to worry about a lion or a baboon up in the tree? That's what some of these kids were, were working with here. So it was really neat to hear a lot of their stories. But I had a really amazing conversation with this lady over here that's sweeping with a broom. I asked her if she's sad that she doesn't have a lot of stuff. And she told me that she feels sorry for me. She said, yeah, I feel sorry for you. You don't remember what it's like to care about the planet anymore. You have a lot of shoes and a lot of clothes and you have all these new phones and everything. But do you appreciate your friends and your family and what the earth gives you? It was just a really amazing experience. And then I got to see wild animals. I got to see African elephants hanging out in a safari. Raise your hand if you would love to see African animals in a, uh, out in a safari one day. I hope I see hands. I can't see you, but I hope there's hands. <laughs> Um, so I always wanted to dream, I always dreamed to see this, so you can see how excited I am. And here um, we were, I was trying not to get too close because I wanted to be safe, but I was being taken around from a safari guide who was teaching me about poaching and how animals, are, animals like the elephants are losing their habitat and they're losing their lives because people are cutting, killing them to cut out their teeth, which is very, very sad. And so he was teaching me about how I could help save elephants all the way over in America. And I thought to myself, wow, well, this is pretty neat. I could actually teach people about the amazing things that are happening on the other side of the planet and how other people, like this man in the bottom left-hand corner, he's not a poacher. He's a guard. He's a guard that walks around the dangerous African savanna looking for poachers to scare them away to protect the animals. And I'm like, wow, I want to I wanna do that. I want to teach people about how to save animals too. So I came back to the country and I decided to start working for zoos. So I started my first career working for Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium in Omaha, Nebraska. <clears throat> and I did a lot of things kind of like what we're doing today. You see me in the bottom corner, I'm talking to a computer, but I'm talking to a classroom. That was in New York, just like I'm talking to some of you in New Jersey and Canada and, and California here today. And then I would also do a lot of live shows as well. I was able to do this at many other zoos because I wanted to get as much experience as possible. So I worked at the Omaha Zoo. I did a lot of animal training and animal rescue with the San Diego Zoo and SeaWorld. And then I got a really cool chance to save all of my money and travel all the way to Australia. And this was a really awesome time. While I was there, I was able to work on the Great Barrier Reef, like you see me holding that license plate there. And then I was able to swim and tag and do some research with whale sharks, like you see in the bottom picture. And I learned a lot about the ocean and how important every ocean species, from the coral reef all the way up to the big sharks, how important that whole ecosystem is that we need to keep that nice and healthy. Are you guys still there? Can I hear you, Joe, so I know you're listening? Oh, yeah. We're still here. We can see everything. Rock on. Okay, cool. It's weird to not talk to people and not be able to see them. <laughs> okay. So <clears throat> then, because I was already on that side of the world, I bought a plane ticket and I went up to Thailand. And you know what? I saw some very interesting things while I was there. First of all, we walk our dogs. And some people in Thailand walk their elephants. And I know you can't see it in the picture very well, but in the bottom left-hand picture, there's a gentleman walking his uh, baby elephant around. I didn't know what that one was about. I tried not to go over there because I didn't know if it was safe or not. 
And then on the right pic right hand picture, I, I know it's also hard to see, but the woman in yellow is holding a baby gibbon, which is a the cousin of a monkey. It's a, a small ape. And what was going on is that the year a year or two before I went there was a really big tsunami. And it ruined a lot of people's lives and destroyed a lot of the country. So a lot of the people were very poor and they were doing everything that they could to, to make money. And so this woman in the yellow, she had actually stole this baby from their mommy. And they were, she was hoping that she could walk around with this baby and either sell it as a pet to make money or she was holding it up hoping that we'd want to take pictures with the baby to make money. And for a long time I was really mad at her. I thought that was really mean to do. But then I realized that if people aren't healthy and can't survive, they're not really going to care about animals. They, they have to do what they've got to do to survive. And I think that was the first time that I thought to myself, we have to make sure that people have enough water and are taken care of because if that's taken care of, then they have the time and the money and the energy to work really hard to save animals. I hope you guys understand what that means. Then there was a really big oil spill in New Zealand, so I saw this as a chance for me to help. And so I went down there to help clean off all the oiled penguins. See, the oil falls out of the ship, and then it goes all over the ocean. And I don't know if you've ever done an experiment with oil and water, but oil, usually, they separate, and the oil goes to the top. And so any type of bird that lands in it ends up in this oily, goopy stuff. And any of the, the penguins that swim up to get a breath of water, they have to swim through the oil. So then they get covered with it. And then when they preen their feathers, they ingest and eat that oil, and it makes them very sick. And so all of the pools that you see in that picture are filled with cleaned, healthy penguins that we are going to release back out in the wild once the ocean was cleaned up from the oil. And in the bottom right-hand picture, I'm about to eat a fish smoothie. Mm -hmm. Because who doesn't do that? <laughs> just kidding. It's not me really eating it. I'm just goofing around. What I did there is I had to cut up fish and I had to grind them in a fish smoothie and then we put it into a um, like a syringe and then you can go to the penguins and you can help them to eat because a lot of them were, were starving at that point. Um, so yeah, I didn't try that. That would be disgusting. I got an opportunity also to go to Borneo and while I was there I studied orangutans and the funny goofy monkey on the bottom is called a proboscis monkey. They have really big bellies and big noses. And when the boys are trying to get a girlfriend, they lift up their nose and go, meh, meh. No, you can't hear me. <laughs> I know you can't see my face, but they're pretty, they're pretty goofy. It was fun to watch them. And then I was also helping the sea turtles. They would come up to the beach. And this was in the same area as the orangutans and the monkeys. They come up on the beach behind me where I'm holding the baby tur turtles. And they would make an entire nest of eggs. And then when they covered it up and went back to the ocean, we would dig the eggs back out again. Now, not because we wanted to eat the turtle eggs. You know, some cultures do do that. We weren't wanting to do that. We wanted to take the eggs and put them in a really safe place where other birds and crabs and mammals wouldn't be able to eat the eggs. Because if they eat the eggs, then the babies can't be born. And then we lose a lot of populations of, of sea turtles. So in the, um, the third picture, you see a bunch of green uh, little cages there. All of those are sea turtle nests, and the one with the red bucket over it is about 50 babies that hatch that day. And at nighttime, when the moon comes out, we put the, the sea turtles in that basket, and then we release them right up close to the ocean, and they magically just know to go into the ocean. It's a pretty cool experience. Another thing I got to do in my life was go to um, a, a country called Papua New Guinea. And while I was there, I worked on a sailboat. Now, I never thought in my life I would ever work on a sailboat. That, I always thought that would be way too hard to do. But I learned all I could about it. And I spent most of my time scuba diving in the ocean, like you see in the bottom left-hand picture. Here I'm helping my friend Alex so that she, we can go in and dive. And what we did is we went around counting all of the fish and all of the sharks, and then when we, we'd record it in our research book, and we would send it to London or Washington, D.C., and then they take that information, and they put it in books and on websites to tell you 
we have 500 of this type of shark left in the ocean. Believe it or not, when you hear those statistics, there's people out there that are counting the animals. Now, we can't catch every single one of them, but that's when we have mathematicians help us round it out and figure out an estimate of how many of the animals are left in the world. And we also got to meet a lot of really cool people while visiting the islands as well. And they taught us about their dancing and food and um, how to survive off the land and how to build straw houses. It was really cool. And you know what? They're not much different than us. They have boyfriends and girlfriends. They want to go to school. They have dreams one day to change the world also. It just, their world looks a little bit different than ours. After about two years of living out of the country, which was pretty hard, you know, you go over the country and you, you're constantly challenged and everything is new and different. I didn't always know the languages or the money, but I was okay. I figured it out, and I know that you could one day too. But after two years, I was pretty tired, and I wanted to come back to America. So I went to Hawaii because I'd always wanted to live on the islands out there. And while I was there, I worked for the Honolulu Zoo. And I, uh, I did a lot of commercials and started doing a lot of small videos and visiting a lot of schools and helping them out with projects. And because of my experience of making a bunch of videos on YouTube, Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom offered me a job to host their animal show. So that's how I got there. I had to interview, I had to do a tryout video, and they picked me. Now, Mutual of Omaha is an insurance company, and so a lot of you could don't have to deal with the insurance stuff because mom and dad do that for you. But they're an insurance company that believes in peeping, keeping people safe and happy and healthy. And they really love to let all of their customers know that they love animals and they love um, teaching people about how to save the, uh, the animal kingdom. And so they helped me by giving me a platform so that I can make videos to teach people about animals. Pretty cool gig, huh? And now I get to be on Facebook and Snapchat and Fine and Pinterest and Twitter, all to teach people about how cool animals are. All right, can you see me, Joe? You're back. Or huh? actually, you just have to share screen one more time on the, the green button again. What am, I, what am I sharing to you now? Oh, that just turned it off. You're back. OK. All right. So before I show you my one of the videos that I have been able to make, because I've made like 20, I've made videos on cheetahs and elephants and penguins and bison and California condors and leopards and kangaroos and everything. But the one I want to show you today is about manatees. But before we move on and we watch my manatee episode, I wanted to check and see if anybody had any questions for me about my life or my travels or any of the jobs that I saw. Okay, so what I'll do, Stephanie, is I'll introduce the classrooms quickly right now, and then maybe we'll steal a question from each one before we uh, look at the manatee video. Okay. Sound good? All right, so joining us today, we have Mrs. Berg's fifth graders, the French fries from New Jersey. Uh, they're actually in for round two right now. They hung out for a Google Hangout this morning with uh, Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. We have uh, Mrs. Razor's second and third from Alta Vista Elementary School in Los Gatos, California. Uh, Mrs. Stouffer and Mrs. Todd's second graders in Lacanto, Florida. Mrs. Klein's fifth graders in San Jose. And then just joining us in the nick of time was Mr. Golahar's um, class from San Antonio, Texas. So we're right across the country today. That's really cool. That's cool. All right. So let's start with, start with uh, Mrs. Razor. Uh, Mrs. Razor. 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 Questions for Stephanie about that? My treat? She said, where did you get your love for animals? Um, um, I think I was born with it. I think all of us are born with a love for animals. Uh, I think that's one way to say it. And then also, when I was your age, I spent a lot of time playing outside. And while I was outside playing in the trees, I would watch the birds, and when I would go down to the creek or the river, I'd watch the fish and, and the birds swimming in the river, and I used to catch uh, frogs, 
and um, and I used to look at them really close and then I didn't obviously want to hurt them and I didn't want to keep them as pets because they're not my pets they're wild animals so I'd, I'd look at them really close and study them and I'd, then I'd put them back down in the creek and I'd follow them and watch them all day I just think that animals are really amazing they have cool lives cool cool adaptations and I think from there I was like hey there's a lot going on in the animal world and I wanted to share what I know about animals with the whole world and I just kept studying them I read a lot of books and I watched a lot of documentaries about animals to learn more alright great question uh, Mrs. Stouffer, Mrs. Todd do you guys have a quick question about Stephanie's adventures Stephanie we spent a lot of time getting questions for um, manatees but let me have a question about for John this way, honey. Straight ahead. Come on. <laughs> She's coming. Was it hard traveling across the country? Very good question. Was it hard traveling across the country and probably around the world? Um, I think, honestly, the hardest part about traveling around the country and around the world is you fighting yourself and a lot of the time we get really scared of things and I think it's because we don't know what's on the other side we don't know what's gonna happen and that scares us a lot and sometimes it scares us so much that we freeze and we don't move we don't go anywhere and we don't do anything but is that gonna help you change the world staying in one place no sometimes you have to be really really brave and what I did is I spent a lot of time researching what it's like to travel and I wanted to know what the other countries were like and what language they spoke and what money they spent uh, I wanted to know what animals were in other places and how I could be safe I think it just takes being really really brave and knowing that this is your dream and you have to go for it and don't let anybody else stop you Mrs. Klein's class do you have a question? Yes. Here we come, we're coming. <laughs> um, um, were you scared tagging the sharks? Oh, great question, too. Uh, no, no, I wasn't afraid of uh, tagging the sharks. I think the, so what we did is I would go out on this boat and it fed a, fit about 10 people. And we would go out, it would take about an hour and a half of driving straight out, the, out into the open ocean. And then you get out there and the ocean is huge and it's so deep that you can't see anywhere compared to if you're swimming or diving around a coral reef you have something to look at I mean you can picture Finding Nemo that's what a coral reef looks like in the ocean but this was open open ocean so I think that was a little bit scary you jump in and you can't see anything and you don't know what's underneath you um, but I, I saw a huge the first time the shark came at me the huge whale shark he was pretty big. He was probably the size of your classroom in terms of how long the classroom is. It was a very big shark. But this shark is not dangerous. We call them gentle giants because they don't, they don't eat things like the great white shark does. So they don't have huge teeth. They have teeny tiny little teeth that they don't even use because, like the humpback whale, they're filter feeders. So as they swim around in the ocean, they just open up their big mouth and go, ah. <laughs> and just eat all these tiny little fish along the way so at first I was really scared because it was big but then I realized he's not gonna eat me it's okay so I backed up out of the way and gave him room to swim by and then I'd have to swim really really fast to try to keep up with him because even though they're big and their tails only moving like this when you are a really huge shark that one movement is like boom he can dart off so fast so the hardest part was getting over knowing that I would be safe and he wouldn't eat me and trying to keep up with him to get that tag on his fin. Great question. All right, French fries. I bet you've got a question. <laughs> what was the favorite place you went to when you were traveling? Oh, you only knew how many times people ask me that and I have the hardest time answering it because everywhere you go around the world has something truly amazing to see you meet great people you see cool animals you see beautiful scenery you have to stay positive and no matter where you go everything is great but if you made me made me pick 
Hmm, I think I would want to go back to the Great Barrier Reef. I'd want to go back to Australia. There's something really crazy about Australia that I really think is neat. And I would definitely recommend you go one day. I'm with you on that one. I lived there for a year and oh, it was hard to leave. It was not an yes. easy place to leave. <laughs> it's not an easy place to leave. All right, Mr. Gallahard, you want to turn your mic on for me and we'll take a question? Maybe no? Yeah, it's just, I think they're using an iPad, so I can't control their microphone, but they should be able to hear me. Mr. Gallagher's class, can you hear me? Wave if you can. Perfect. Can you, can you turn your microphone on for me? Huh. Okay. Well, no luck right now. Maybe we'll get it on for the questions afterwards. Um, okay. Well, then I guess no further ado. Let's bring on the manatees. <laughs> All right. Ooh, I think they're trying to turn it on. I have the videos as well loaded up on my end too, if whichever end's easier to share from. You know what? Um, let me see if I can share it really quick, and if not, we'll have you do it. So screen share desktop. Start screen share so you can see my screen. Looking good so far. Yeah. Yep. Manatees are in a group of animals called Cyrenians. If you trace the Cyrenian family tree, it takes you back about 50 million years or more. But did manatees start out as an aquatic mammal? Or did they look a bit more terrestrial? Believe it or not, Cyrenians like the Florida manatee share a common ancestor with elephants, aardvarks, and hyraxes. And yes, their distant ancestor used to be terrestrial, which means they lived on land. But as time passed, conditions on Earth changed and the earliest manatee ancestor took to the water, becoming more of an amphibious animal who enjoyed life on land and in the water. Now manatees have become 100% aquatic and have flippers instead of legs. But one thing's for sure, their ancestor passed on their tooth structure, fingernails, and prehensile upper lips to the four species of Serenians that we enjoy around the world today. Check this out guys, these are manatee molars. They have anywhere between 24 and 32 teeth in their mouth at any given time. As each individual one wears down, they fall out. What's really neat though, is that they grow in from the back of the jaw and then they move forward. That's why they call them marching molars. These goofy prehensile lips are kind of like an elephant's trunk, just much shorter. Each side can move independently and are studded with specialized sensory bristles and hairs called vibrissae. This allows them to distinguish between the best plants. It's shocking to learn that manatees have similar hand structure to humans. They even have fingernails like terrestrial elephants. This is remnant of a life on land and still aids them in walking or pushing along the bottom of the seabed. Or even better, to pull out plants like a human wearing mittens. Now check out their front flipper. They use these pectoral flippers to, to grasp things and help change directions in their environment. And at the very tip, you'll see they have those nails. Very good. Maybe one day, new research will tell us more about what that 50 million year old amphibious manatee was like. But until then, I'll enjoy how their gentle old soul gives me a glimpse into the past, imagining the life of a creature from another time in history. All right. Am I back? Very cool. So that's just one of the episodes, but we have four total. I know that you had already shared intro with everybody, 
If you wanted to, you could share one of the other two, or we can move on to questions in chatting. Why don't we grab some questions, because they can watch the other ones afterwards if they want to as well. Sounds Sound good. good. All yeah. right. Um, well, let's start with uh, Mrs. Stouffer's class this time, and Mrs. Todd's, because I know they have some manatee questions ready to go. Well, um, who asked about the algae? JT? I'm going to go ahead and ask, where were you in Florida? We were at Crystal River. Okay, well that's where we live. So are oh, you... Really? Yeah, sort of. And we're really close. Okay. That's, but the algae that's growing there in the water, were you aware of that? The red algae? Yes. The blues? Yes. So they want to know why does it hurt them and is there a way that can be fixed? Why does that hurt the manatee, and is there a way that can be fixed? Yes. Okay. Um, so first of all, the algae that grows on them um, is a natural algae. Algae and funguses and, um, my goodness, there's all different types of these plant structures that can grow on the land and on the water. But what's happening is that we have a lot of cattle farms and all different types of farms all over in Florida. Florida prides themselves in having some of the best cows to eat in the US. But when we have a lot of cows, and then we have to give them a lot of different chemicals and hormones and all these things to make sure that the cows are healthy enough for humans to eat. Now, when they are cleaning off the area where the cows live, and when they're feeding them the food that they give them, they have to use pesticides on the food to clean off the food so the food doesn't get taken over and run over by, by uh, insects. So the biggest issue is the chemicals that are being used on a, in a lot of the cattle ranches and other types of farms are running off, off the land into the creeks, from the creeks into the rivers, and then the rivers into the estuaries and the estuaries into the ocean. And in those chemicals is a specific thing called phosphorus. And phosphorus, when it gets a lot of oxygen and a lot of sun, blows up and grows like crazy. And now you have, you have this algae that survives off this phosphorus and off these chemicals. Now, the algae isn't the healthiest plant for animals, not just like manatees, but all animals to eat. So when the manatees are eating it, and they're not purposely trying to eat the algae, they're trying to eat the sea grasses that grow around Florida. But what happens is that the algae grows on top of the grasses. So you understand that the manatees are going around just trying to eat the grass. But what's on the grass is that chemical. And then those chemicals and that from the, the algae are going into their body and actually disrupting their body and not allowing them to digest food properly, which is making them very sick. And unfortunately, a lot of manatees are dying from it. That is why using a lot of chemicals on our land for agriculture is not a good idea sometimes. All right, that was an awesome question. Let's uh, grab one from Mr. Gallagher's class in San Antonio. Let's try again. Try, I just raised your volume a little higher. See if you guys can uh, just talk this time. See if that'll work. We got gotcha. you. I can hear you. Hello. Yep, we can you hear you this time. We got gotcha. you. Awesome. All right. Have you ever been bitten by an animal you have ever handled? Have I ever been bitten by an animal? Uh, yes. Short answer, yes. I try very hard to learn about animals, and um, the more you learn about them, the more you learn about how they behave, you know, how, what upsets them to make them bite, or what makes them happy, or what type of things they do with their body to show you that they're hungry. Like your dog might wag its tail and chase you or bark. Um, some animals might bite your hand to say, hey, I'm hungry. I try to learn a lot about animals so that neither of us get hurt, especially me. I don't want to get bit by anything. Um, but if you're working with certain animals like parrots or let's say baby leopards, not going to lie to you, sometimes they get playful and they bite you and it hurts really, really bad. 
I'm happy I have all my fingers. <laughs> um, just like your cat likes to play and scratch and bite you, um, so do a lot of baby cats and baby bears and stuff like that. And they're not trying to hurt you. They just are, are playing. You understand that, right? But the only difference is they're not a pet. Dogs are domesticated animals that are, are meant to be pets or helpful for pets. A baby leopard or a baby bear is not a pet. Their, sharp, their claws are way sharper. They're 10 times stronger than a baby cat. Um, so I try to do everything I can to make sure that that doesn't happen. Thankfully, I don't, um, I've never gotten myself in a position where anything really bad has happened. But I have gotten scratched and bit. I've been peed on. I've been pooped on. <laughs> I've had anything that could happen with an animal happen before. But that's the nature of the game, and you have to know what you're getting yourself into when you're working with animals. All right. Good answer. Uh, Mrs. Klein's class, your mic is on. Um, we have a question, Maggie or McKenna? Okay, all right, go. <laughs> Why is a manatee's skin so rough? Why is the manatee's skin so rough? Well, a lot of people, first of all, think that their skin is really, really thick. It's kind of thick, but it's not as thick as you would think it would be. Um, they don't also have blubber like a seal would, so the cold water makes them really cold. Um, so that's one thing about their skin. And then the outer layer of their skin, the texture of it being a little bit rough, actually, I mean, it, I don't think it's super rough. It's kind of rough. What I think is really weird about a manatee skin is their hair. Remember, manatees are mammals, so they are warm-blooded. They have a live birth. They, they're born with hair. Uh, and sometimes we forget that dolphins and manatees being, uh, and whales, that they could have hair. And their hair is so spread out, but it's very thick and coarse. So you're going over the animal, which their skin's a little bit rough, and then you hit something that feels like a wire sticking out of their skin, and that's their hair. And something really cool that we learned about, that if you keep watching the other manatee episodes, is that they we're figuring out that their hair is so sensitive that if Let's say you are sitting where you're at now. If you imagine the manatee on the other side of the room and you're underwater and you went like this in the water and you created a ripple effect, that they like a ripple under the water, they would be able to feel it on their hair. And wherever they felt it, they would know that's where that's coming from. And so then they would go, oh, I felt a ripple touch my hairs over here. There must be a shark over there. I got to look over and look for it. Or... Maybe it's the vibrations that are rippling over and hitting the manatee's hair, saying that a boat's coming and that they need to get out of the way. So that's a really cool thing we've been learning about manatee's skin and their hair, is that it might be kind of like a sense. Maybe they can't see the ripple, but they can feel the ripple through their hair, which is pretty cool. Very cool. It's a great question as well. Uh, Mrs. Razor's class. Ah, there we go. There we go. How long do manatees get? How long can they How get? How long can they get? Yep. Um, while I was there, I saw some that were over 10 feet long. So if I'm 5 feet long <laughs> and they're 10 feet long, they were double my size. But I've heard that some of them can get between 12 and 18 feet long. That would be a really, really big manatee. I would say between 10 and 15 feet long, a full-grown adult. So imagine maybe putting your mom and your dad, if you stood them on top of each other, that would be a really big manatee. <laughs> All right. New Jersey, the French fries. Do you have a favorite animal? That's another question I get all the time besides where is my favorite place on the planet. Oh my, that's a very, very hard question. The short answer is, no, my, my shortish, longish answer. I love dogs as pets. I would never get any other animal as a pet other than a dog. 
Two, I think goats are the funniest animal on the planet. I think that they make weird noises. I think they have weird eyes. I think it's funny when the males with their antlers or their antlers, their horns come up to each other and they go boom and they hit each other on the head and then they back up and go meh. <laughs> I just think that that's really funny. So I, I goats make me laugh. Um, I really love sharks a lot. I, I tend to like the animals that a lot of people are afraid of that I think they're afraid of because TV makes them look way scarier than they really are. Sharks have kind of a bad reputation and I like to teach people that sharks are super cool and not to believe all the mean things that are about that are said about them. But in general, I it's not that I like one particular animal super super bad. It's more that I love teaching about how important all animals are to the planet and that they have a job and to teach people what those jobs are and how it affects your life, that's what I think is cool. All right, I'm right with you there on the sharks. Those are yeah. definitely animals I like to be in the water with. I love sharks. Yeah. Um, so if there are any classes at this stage whose period might be coming to an end, um, feel free to log off if you have to. But otherwise, I'm going to start cycling through again. And Stephanie, if you have time, can we do another round of questions? Yes. All right. You have to leave? Oh, I was just saying, just in case any classes had to, just if their period was ending. Well, if they had to, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Another uh, round. Let's go back to Florida. Get some questions if you have some more. Where do manatees live? Other than Florida, where do manatees live? Okay, so manatees are in a group of animals called Sirenians. And um, so I'll answer that one. So manatees, uh, there's different types of manatees, and we like to also call them sea cows um, because they like to go around and graze on the sea grasses in the ocean. Um, so the other type of manatee out there is called a dugong. Isn't that a funny word, dugong? <laughs> Dugongs are a little bit bigger than manatees. They live, um, manatee families, the Serenians, so the manatees and the dugongs live around Florida, all the way down to the Caribbean, to the tip of South America. And then we also have some uh, dugongs that will live on the west side of Australia. Like when I was swimming with that picture of the manatee, or with the whale shark, I used to see dugongs swimming around too. And I used to think they were baby whales because they get so big. And so dugongs live around Western Australia and then up on the top part of Australia and they go all the way up to India and some of them all go all the way over to Madagascar. All right. Great question. Do you guys have another one? Oh, for Ms. Stoffers? Um, Alexa? Um, are you going to ask? Um, she gets nervous. No, I don't. Go ahead. What, is, what are you going to ask? Do you want your question? How many babies can they have? How many babies can manatee have? That's what you know, typically, they only have one. It has been known for them to have twins, but it's pretty rare. Usually, they can only handle one calf at a time. <laughs> Okay, so our third, our second and third graders uh, are still here. Do you guys have another question? Let me turn your mic on for you. Do any animals hunt manatees? I would say manatees. Um, typically, anything that would hunt it would probably be sharks. If it's a dugong, so the bigger manatee that lives um, over by Australia, and in between Australia and Africa, they would be hunted by killer whales and also great white sharks. They're pretty big animals, so normally they have bigger predators. Um, and then the other way that they get hurt is probably from humans. Not that humans hunt them to eat them, but he, um, a lot of them are struggling because of human behavior. So those are the those would be like their predators. All right, good question. Um, well, why don't we visit each class one more time, and then we'll we'll sign off for today. So, today, so uh, sticking with uh, our second and third, with our second, one, one more question, question, a final question, question, a final question. 
How long do manatees live? Sorry, what? How long Sorry. do manatees live? I think that's what he said, yep. Oh, it can range. We It depends on what species we're talking about, but generally they live eh, 10 to 25 years. Okay, and one more time. Why don't they pull their whole head out of the water to breathe? Oh, that is a smart one. I like that question, too. Why don't manatees stick their entire head out of the water when they breathe? Well, the reason for that is because they want to try to be secretive. They don't want to give off where they're at. So a lot like a, a sea turtle or a crocodile, and sometimes even dolphins, even though dolphins breathe from their nose uh, further back on their back, they don't need to stick their whole heads up because their noses are just at the very tip or are very close to where the surface is. So they'll usually come up really calmly, just stick their nose up, open up their nose hole, and take in about two big breaths. And they're big because their lungs are really large. So go huge breath of air, and then out. And then huge breath of air, and then out. And one more usually, and then they hold it, and they can sink down in the water, and they can hold their breath between 5 and 15 minutes. And so they, that's how having big lungs helps you hold your air for a really long time. But they don't need to completely stick their whole body out of the water because it would take a lot of energy. Number two, they don't want anybody to see where they're at. They're trying to be secretive so they don't get hurt. Okay. Well, Stephanie, first of all, thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. A lot of fun to see some of the places you've been and then uh, – you know, to ask a few questions about manatees, which are animals that, with the exception of our class in Florida, um, people don't get to see a lot. So that's really, really cool. Um, what we'll do now is, just before I turn the mics on for the classes, say thank you and goodbye. Do you have anything you'd like to leave the students with? Maybe a message or something? Yeah. So I really want to thank you for joining my presentation today. It was really cool to not, you know, to be able to do this on the computer. That makes technology is pretty cool. Uh, so thank you so much for joining today and wanting to learn more about my life and about manatees. Um, I want to leave you with follow your dreams. Everybody has a skill, a talent, and a purpose. Please do not be afraid to share it with the world. You all deserve to share that with the world. And be brave. Just be brave. Don't let other your friends or even your family member, when you get old enough to travel the world, don't let them tell you you can't do something. You know, you can make it work and don't let money or mean people get in your way. If you believe in it and you really want it, then you can make it happen. And then also, you can help save the world every single day. You want to know how? I'll yeah? Yeah. Yeah, you want to know? Okay. So a lot of people think you have to go out and do a beach cleanup or you have to be a zookeeper or an animal person like me or a teacher to save the world. But every single day we can help save the world by the things that we buy. So if you don't need things, don't buy them. So the thing that I want to really encourage you to quit using is straws and plastic bags. Okay, That's something that you can quit doing or work on stop using every single day because when we make straws and plastic bags, one of the ingredients to make plastic is oil. So we have to drill oil from the planet, and then sometimes accidents happen and we have oil spills. Now, let's say everything goes okay with making the ingredients of oil to make the plastic. You use a plastic straw and a plastic bag for such a short amount of time, right? It's so quick. And so we use it very quickly and then we throw it away and sometimes they can't be recycled and used again so they end up in our landfills and sometimes they don't even end up in the landfills because they'll be in a garbage truck and the air will blow it out and it'll land in a creek which ends up in the river which ends up in the ocean and we all know we've seen it enough that animals will swallow straws and plastic bags it's very sad and it is hurting our, our oceans so if you could promise me today that you can try your best to stop using straws and plastic bags. You're not a two-year-old baby. You don't need a straw. We can drink cups just like this. Also, you get reusable bags. And if you only have a couple items, 
use these awesome hands that we have. Look how cool they are. And they have thumbs to grab things. You can hold stuff to take it out to the car and bring it into your house after you go to the grocery store. Does that sound like a plan to you guys? That's the way you that's the way you So thank you so much for helping out animals and helping out people too, because we don't want a polluted planet either. All right, well I've turned All the right. mic I've turned the mic so the classes can say goodbye and thank say goodbye and thank you so much. I can't wait to connect again for another session for another session. All right, signing off. Signing off. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.